Sophisticated smart materials can react to outside forces to protect bridges and buildings, but they can be even more lifelike, allowing us to realize one of humanity's oldest dreams. The flying ability of birds has always captured the human imagination. But when it comes to flying, birds have us beat on a bunch of levels. Sure, we can fly in a hang glider and gain some of the sense of how a bird soars. Or we can build jet fighters that can dive from the sky the way a bird can tuck its wings in and shoot toward Earth. But a bird does all that and more thanks to an elegant feature that's the envy of aircraft designers, a flexible shape-changing wing. Ironically, heavier-than-air flight started out using a more bird-like wing than we use today. The Wright brothers employed a steering system of wires and pulleys that actually bent the wings of the right flyer to control its direction. Not unlike the way a bird steers by altering its wing shape. But as planes became bigger, designers needed stiffer materials and hinged parts for flight control. The legacy of that is the mechanical complexity of your average airliner wing. It's got ailerons, flaps, slats, and air brakes. That's a lot of motors, hinges, and moving parts, all of which disrupt airflow and add weight, a big loss in efficiency. But imagine if all that shape changing could be done the way a bird does it, just by bending the wings. That may sound way out, but for more than a decade at Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, Virginia, Dan Inman has been exploring just that kind of shape-changing wing using smart materials. Today is the first test flight of this experimental remote control aircraft built by students in his lab. We're trying to make a, a shape-changing wing, try to imitate uh, uh, more of what a bird would do by having the wings bend rather than having a discrete flap like on a normal aircraft. And so this doesn't, it has this smooth surface. Inman can ditch the flaps and the various cables and motors that control them by bending the wing using a smart material embedded in those plastic strips. It's called a piezoelectric ceramic. That's a mouthful, but these materials change their shape in response to an electrical charge. In this case, that's supplied by batteries on the plane and controlled electronically from the ground. Now this is gonna be the very first flight in this configuration, right? Absolutely. Have you considered the fact that you're on a high definition national television broadcast and it could flop? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so this is it? The main yes. flight? Flop it does, due to a faulty wire. But you can't keep the Virginia Tech Hokies down. One spare fuselage and an hour later, they're back for round two. One, two, three, Hokies! She flies! She flies! Second time's the charm. And chalk up a big win for Birdman Inman and his team. For the pilot, learning how to fly using the new wings is like learning how to walk. But it's easy to see the bird in the plane's acrobatics. With engineers putting more avian back into aviation, one day you may look out your airliner's window to see smart materials bending the trailing edge of the wing. You might even see the entire shape of the wing altering in flight, thanks to some metals 
with great memories. This Wire Nova logo is made from a nickel and titanium alloy. The metal was invented in the late 50s for use in missile nose cones, but then, by accident, it was discovered to have an astonishing quality. If I stretch out this wire and then apply a little heat, it snaps back to its original size and shape. Scientists call materials like this shape memory alloys, or SMAs, but they might as well call them artificial muscles. That's how they're being put to work here. This jellyfish robot from Virginia Tech swims without any kind of motor. In a design inspired by real jellyfish, it's propelled by the contractions of an artificial muscle made of metal embedded in its silicone bell. Electric current heats the material to trigger the action. Eventually, a small battery will provide the power. The goal of this work, paid for by the Navy, is a motion-detecting buoy that's inconspicuous. If it looks like a jellyfish, then maybe somebody will think it is a jellyfish and not bother it. Oh, so. I see. So we could actually spy on the bad guys. You know, <laughs> Wait, who goes there? Oh, it's just a jellyfish. Even beyond artificial muscle, shape-shifting metals and plastics may be the shape of things to come. Imagine if your watch could morph into your cell phone, or your family sedan could turn into a roadster. But today, shape memory alloys are saving lives. This is a stent. It's designed to keep an artery open. Surgeons can shrink it down for insertion, and then the heat of the body, like this hot water, expands it into place. Smart. Just one example of how new materials have revolutionized the world of medicine. That's a revolution that's been decades in the making. I head to Massachusetts to see a professor at MIT who runs the largest bioengineering lab in the world. For many, chemical engineer Bob Langer personifies the new role of materials science in medicine. Wow, this is your office? Yeah, yes it is. <laughs> too, too bad nobody's recognized your work. Well, I, I've, been, I've been lucky. <laughs> but it didn't start out that way. I mean, you know, when I started working, I think for the first 10 or 15 years, nobody cared about what we were doing at all. After graduating from MIT in the 70s, Bob entered an unlikely field, cancer research, an area with few, if any, chemical engineers. At that time, medical advances depended on whatever was at hand. What doctors would do is they'd go to their house, they'd find an object that kind of resembled, say, the organ or tissue they were trying to fix, and then they'd use it in a patient. Doctors cobbled together solutions. Sausage casings became the basis for dialysis machines. Squishy mattress stuffing was put inside breast implants, and the elastic in ladies' girdles was used for artificial hearts. Instead of this scavenger hunt, Langer took an engineering approach. Rather than pick something from your house, why can't you ask the design question, what do you really want from an engineering standpoint, chemistry standpoint, biology standpoint, and then could we synthesize it? Over the years, Langer's approach has paid off. Some of his biggest breakthroughs have been in drug delivery. He invented plastic implants that can release a drug at a steady rate for up to five years. So how do you do that? How do you control the rate and the duration? Well, there's several ways to do it. It could have what we call tortuosity in it, winding paths. When you make these winding paths in a piece of plastic, it'll take a long time for the molecules to get through. A drug molecule encased in Langer's plastic is like a car trying to leave a city without a map. In Manhattan, the grid system makes that fairly easy. Just going straight takes you to the outer edge. That's like a low tortuosity, fast release plastic. But a high tortuosity, delayed release plastic is like Boston. With its winding streets, you might find yourself lost for days, months, maybe even years. So are these smart materials you're working with? They are. I'd say they're the first generation of smart materials because 
they're really aimed to deliver at the right rate, to degrade at the right rate. So yeah, I think they're, they're pretty smart. Langer's second generation, still in the research phase, takes an even smarter approach. Traditional intravenous chemotherapy nukes the body with toxic chemicals to kill cancer cells. The problem is that the required dose also harms a lot of healthy tissue. Langer's brought a new weapon to the battle. Tiny drug particles, nano-sized, that's billionths of a meter, to be sent special delivery to just the cancer cells. Targeted chemotherapy where you could take the nuking material, so to speak, put it in the nanoparticle and have the nanoparticle direct it right to the tumor and, and not other places in the body. How does that work? How can yeah. it know what a cancer cell is? And it's, it's actually very challenging. It's really developing a way to decorate outside of them with just the right combination of materials. He starts with a nanoparticle of anti-cancer drug. That gets encased in a plastic that releases the drug over time. That, in turn, gets a special wrapping that disguises the package as a water molecule to fool the body's immune system. And last but not least, the address where it should be delivered, a key that will only fit the lock of cancer cells. This is just one slice of Langer's work at the intersection of materials and medicine. He's got 700 patents and counting in drug delivery, tissue engineering, and even hair products. Robert Frost said it very well in his poem. You know, I ended up taking the road not taken, and I think it's a path that now many more people are taking, and I think it's a path where engineers and material scientists can just do a lot of good for the world, and so I think it's a, a wonderful path. Forty years ago, smart materials barely existed. Now, not only can they mimic nature, they can move radically beyond it to accomplish what has always seemed impossible.